Welcome everybody to another tutorial. This one you've been asking for quite a lot, namely how to make this scene. Or more specifically, how to create this scene using Vortex. If you don't know what Vortex is, it's, it's essentially a post-processing step to add a ton of detail to viewed simulations afterwards. So you can see in this example from the previous scene that the actual mesh of the fluid has pretty much no detail at all. It's very smooth, very low resolution. So it was also really easy to bake this fluid simulation. But then in the end, it still has a ton of animated detail and waves and ripples that you wouldn't see otherwise. And Vortex also includes a nice volumetric water shader. Now this is of course perfect for low end machines, uh, but also for high end machines, if you just want to run very large fluid simulations or very long ones uh, and still add ex extra detail. Uh, by the way, if you don't have it yet, there will be a link in the description to get Vortex. So most of the tutorial will be focused on the fluid dynamics, of course. But in the end, I'll quickly go over the environment setup and the rendering setup I used in the previous scene. And you can follow along step by step. I better try to keep things general, explain why I'm doing things, and give mostly just a bunch of tips and tricks, which you should also be able to transfer to other projects. That being said, let's get started. Okay, let's start with the surface that the river is going to flow on. I use a cube here instead of a plane because solid objects are usually a bit more reliable when it comes to simulations. And I'm going to use loop cut for creating the geometry of the river itself. Now for getting the river to flow in an organic shape, I'm using proportional editing, which drags around nearby vertices to make everything look a bit more smooth. doesn't have to be perfect since most of it's going to be underwater anyway. And of course, since we want uh, the river to flow downwards, make sure that either you create the river in the shape already that's flowing down or just rotate everything slightly. The next step will be to add the fluid domain and the fluid emitter. In this example, I'm going to use flip fluids, but the process will be pretty much exactly the same for MantaFlow. I'll point out where the differences are. MantaFlow is the default uh, Blender fluid simulation. Start by making a domain. It's just a large box that is just big enough to fit in the entire river. And now here, depending on whether you want to use MantaFlow or flip fluids, just choose either of these buttons and select domain. You should probably set the resolution a bit higher than you're used to, because the resolution here is actually the one along the longest side of the river. And since it's a very stretched out object, you see that even though I'm choosing 128 here, it's actually only 32 and 14 in width and height of the cube. Now this next step will only be necessary if you're using flip fluids. If you're using the default Blender simulation, you can just ignore this part. Uh, namely, it's important that you go down to flip fluid surface settings and enable velocity attributes. But these might not be here. If you don't see these options, you have to go into the add-on preferences, look at flip fluids, and there should be a checkbox somewhere for enabling developer tools. After that, it should work. If you don't see that checkbox either, then you might need to upgrade to a more recent flip fluid version. Now the emitter can get a bit more tricky because the emitter has to be large enough to actually fill up a couple of the cells of the fluid domain. But of course, it shouldn't be so large that the water goes everywhere and doesn't fall into the river. So we start by adding a cube as an emitter. And similarly, either just choose the regular fluid button or flip fluid. And then either inflow or flow. To make it a bit easier for ourselves, let's just increase the height of the river at this point and just make sure that this will always be out of view from the camera. Now inside, you should probably increase the amount of sub-step emissions. 
or you could get artifacts later. To two or three here. Uh, and we want some speed. Now looking at the axis here, we need speed in the positive Y direction. So the water will already start coming out with a certain velocity. You could already try to bake the simulation right now by going into the fluid domain and using the bake settings here, but then the water will just fall straight through the river because we have actually never specified that it's an obstacle for the fluids to interact with. So you should also have to find obstacle in the fluid settings for the river. Uh, and add some friction here because if you remember, there were some V shapes in the river that only happen if the water in the center of the river is going faster than around it. So if you add some friction that it makes sure that the sides of the river are going slower because they're near the boundary. Uh, this is the only way you would get those V shaped rapids. And now comes the hard part, the actual baking of the simulation. Uh, you should do this from the domain. Be prepared to do this a couple times. Uh, one tip I can give is that in the side panel, you can scroll down for flip fluids that is. For Manta flow, you don't need to do this. Uh, and enable auto load baked frame. So it's easier to start up a simulation and after a few frames, you can see if you want to restart it with different parameters or not. Uh, I'll just leave everything as it is right now, uh, bake it once and then come back. So it's done baking after about a minute or so. Uh, and I can immediately use this as an example for the things that you might want to look for, might want to change. Uh, first of all, uh, I set the velocity quite high for the emitter, which means that the simulation cannot always keep up. You can see a lot of those bands here. You can see that for every frame, of the simulation, there's a band of particles, or in this case, you just see some bumps. Uh, the way to solve this is to either increase the amount of sub-steps further uh, in the emitter. And for flip fluids, you also have to be aware that in the advanced settings, you might have to increase the minimum frame sub-steps, so it actually make use of all of the ones that you set in the emitter. And that will make things more smoothly. But in general, I think this simulation just needs to be a bit slower it will flow down the river itself. It's not like it's coming from a pressure jet. So I'll actually just set the velocity to zero here because I happen to know that for this simulation, the water just flows down by itself due to gravity fast enough already. And another thing is that besides the general bands here, you would also see some loose particles, some bumps, um, and things this can go away in two ways can either increase the resolution of the simulation a lot so that the particles become small enough to not be visible anymore, but you can also actually decrease the simulation resolution. So the particles become so large that you don't actually notice them. Now, of course, the higher resolution will be more realistic, more accurate, and that would also be preferred, but it takes a lot longer to render. Uh, so and to keep this uh, tutorial more easy to follow and also to stay closer to the original scene, which also used a lower resolution. I'll turn down the resolution here from 128 to 64. Okay, and now that's done. Uh, before we move on, one quick thing to note. If you want to leave the simulation running for longer, then of course the water is going to be piling up at the end here. For flip fluids, the way you'd get around this is by adding not just an inflow object, but also an outflow object that will be large enough to catch all the water going out and all the water will disappear. So add a new object, flip fluids, and then outflow. For Manta flow, so the default blender fluid simulation, what you can do is just select which sides of the domain are uh, supposed to pass water through. So the water will just disappear as soon as it leaves the box here at one of the sides. Now it's finally ready to use Vortex. We can forget about all the simulation settings now and move on to the shading tab. Make sure to actually select the object that has the surface and not just the domain. And instead of adding a new material, you should see this Vortex Manager tab if you installed it correctly, and that's going to create the material for us. Uh, in this case, select to use Flip Fluids, I want to disable Vortex Foam because I don't want to see a lot of foam in this river. Uh, 
but I am going to enable suspension. And suspension just means that there's going to be some mud in the water. Uh, if you disable it, it will be crystal clear. Generate material, and there is now a fully set up material uh, with some default settings. Uh, I'm now going to go over my workflow for finding the best settings with Vortex. Um, to start, isolate this object by using the slash symbol. It's a shortcut for just seeing this object. And now with a node ranger add-on, it should be already pre-installed. If not, just go to Edit Preferences, Node Wrangler, find it here. And then press Control click on the Vortex Flow node. Now this shows the actual details added by Vortex itself. Um, to make it even easier to understand what's going on, I will disable the animation here. Um, wave animation speed. That's a static background animation that would always go on that isn't influenced by the fluid velocity. So it doesn't move along with the fluid, but it just keeps some variation in it. And the variation is would make it more difficult to understand what's going on. So just disable it here. The next few values, wave scale, detail, and roughness, might sound familiar because they are the same values that you would see in noise nodes. Um, what that means is that if I increase the scale of the waves here, that there will be more waves that are smaller uh, and vice versa. I can increase or decrease the amount of detail they have uh, and increase or decrease the amount of roughness they have, as you can see here. So this is mostly artistic preference, depends on what exactly you would like your simulation to look like and how large scale you want your fluid to feel, of course. Uh, if you want your fluid to look like a giant sea, then you want to have lots of small waves inside the giant sea. If the fluid is itself is only very small, then it's not going to have a lot of um, more details smaller inside. If you're happy with the skill, you can check out what it actually looks like in animation just by using the arrow keys to move forward and backward one frame at a time. You should see that this pattern, this distorted nurse texture is following along with the fluid. The amount by which it gets distorted and the amount by which it is flowing along with the rest of the liquid uh, depends on the flow distance. So if this value will be zero, then everything will just stay in place. On the other hand, if the value is way too large, then things would become overly distorted. So you have to find the right balance. And yeah, just make sure that it moves around roughly as fast as you see the mesh of the fluid moving. And again, this comes down to personal preference. For the remaining values, wind angle, wind speed, and wind stretching aren't really relevant right now. You could use it, for instance, again, if you had a large sea and you wanted all the waves to be generally moving in the same direction and be shaped along that direction. Particle density and density blending is only relevant if you're using mantle flow, and again, only if you're using mantle flow and you're seeing some very specific artifacts. Usually the default setting should be enough and you don't have to worry about these. Time is purple here because it's automated to follow the frame number. So you can leave that value known, it should follow along fine. If you're not happy with the speed of the simulation or the speed of the animation, I should say, you can change it through the time scale instead of actually changing the time value here itself. And lastly, you might want to uh, reintroduce some wave animation speed, which is going to make it so that you wouldn't see the same patterns appear over and over again, because the default is that it cycles through a certain loop uh, and having this set to a non-zero value will make the loop slightly different every time. So that were all the important settings on the vortex flow node. The bump node can you should just be ignored. Uh, one thing you might want to change is in the water shader, Vortex water, you might want to change the density. So we were talking about the suspension earlier, the muddiness of the water. Uh, the density determines the strength of that effect. So using node wrangler again, instead to preview the final node, or just of course connecting surface to surface here, uh, you'll see that the water is sort of see-through right now, uh, but setting this way higher would make it much darker.
So that's about all the advice I can give you about using Vortex, the Vortex shader, the simulation setup to recreate a river like that or something similar. Um, but as promised, I'll also quickly go over the render setup, the environment I used in the original scene. And this is it. This is the scene that was used for the final animation. Uh, there's four things I want to point out, and none of them are about the river itself because everything is done in the exact same way as that I've showed you before. Um, so the first thing is what you probably noticed immediately, the particles, uh, the rocks that are added, uh, some grass, some plants. Unfortunately, I cannot redistribute them due to licensing, uh, but you can find plenty of these for free online and add them using a hair particle system on the ground object. The second thing, um, it feels kind of like cheating, but it's actually pretty useful to know, uh, and cheating is allowed in CGI. Is that the ground plane that is used here for, for instance, the particles and the one that you're seeing is not actually the same one as that's being used for the simulation. So you would notice that if I enable river collision, uh, this is actually the model that was used for generating the river. Uh, am I separating this from the model in the final scene? It gives you a lot more freedom to shape the visual structure of the, the um, dirt around the river. Uh, well, you can still have, for instance, very high walls to make sure that your river stays within a certain area. And in this case, also to use some low poly obstacles and then later fill them in with uh, high resolution photo scanned rocks. Next up is a trick I use for the lighting. Let's enable the collision first. Um, you might have noticed that in the render there are some shadows. Um, those shadows don't actually come from real objects. Instead, there is just a plane hovering in the sky. Uh, and on it is a texture of uh, a forest roof. So there are some trees here whereas just the background is masked out to be transparent. So this projects a shadow on top of the floor here uh, with some nice details, some tree-like shapes in it. And then finally, to get the animation where the camera is moving around the river, uh, there's an empty in the scene. You can just edit with Shift A, empty and empty axis in this case, uh, which acts as a pivot point for the camera. So the camera is actually using the empty as a parent. And the empty is animated so that it rotates. And that in turn makes the camera move around it. Uh, and then this, the same empty can also be used as a focal point for depth of field to give some more nice depth effects. And that was the last step. Using all of this together should get you a result that looks something like this. I hope you were able to learn something from this. Please put any questions you have down in the comments. And don't forget to check out Vortex if you haven't gotten it yet. Thanks for watching.